Greetings, scholars, and welcome to Following the Gong, a podcast of the Shrier Honors College at Penn State. Following the Gong takes you inside conversations with our scholar alumni to hear their story so you can gain career and life advice and expand your professional network. You can hear the true breadth of how scholar alumni have gone on to shape the world after they ran the gong and graduated with honors and learn from their experiences so you can use their insights in your own journey. This show is proudly sponsored by the Scholar Alumni Society, a constituent group of the Penn State Alumni Association. I'm your host, Sean Goheen, class of 2011 and college staff member. If this is your first time joining us, welcome. If you're a regular listener, welcome back. Tamara Hambrick, class of 2005, is currently the Boeing Enterprise Strategy and Operations Deputy Functional Chief Engineer for Systems Engineering. Her previous roles were at Boeing and Northrop Grumman Corporation in Systems Engineering, Model-Based Engineering, and Engineering Leadership. Tamara earned her Bachelor's of Science in Engineering Science with honors from Penn State's College of Engineering in 2005. She has also earned a Master's Certificate in Systems Engineering from Johns Hopkins and a Graduate Certificate in Architecture and Systems Engineering from MIT. Tamara discusses how her time at Penn State influenced her career, including her experience as a Birch cheerleader, to all things systems engineering and engineering leadership. While great for any scholar, this episode will be particularly of interest for scholars who started at a campus other than University Park, are majoring in engineering, looking to engage their industry through professional associations, and women in STEM fields. Her full bio and a detailed breakdown of topics discussed are available in the show notes on your podcast app. With that, let's get into our conversation with Tamara Hambrick following the gong. Joining me here today on Following the Gong is engineering leader and executive Tamara Hambrick. Tamara, thank you so much for joining us here today. Well, thank you for having me, Sean. I'm really looking forward to our conversation about engineering leadership and all the great things you have done at Northrop and at Boeing. But I always like to start at the beginning with your Genesis story of how you came to Penn State and eventually the Schreier Honors College. Oh, wonderful. That was uh, just by accident, in all honesty, growing up in a rural uh, community in Pennsylvania and around really not much of engineering and more about mechanical systems that my father was working on, whether it was a car or motorcycle. And so, you know, in my early years in high school, the loving math and science, I really had no clue about engineering fields or what college is. And my, you know, calculus teacher in 12th grade was speaking about engineering. And I was like, well, I'll look for colleges. And I applied across Pennsylvania because I wanted to be close to home. And one of them was Penn State. And it was also Drexel and other universities within the Pennsylvania Commonwealth. Wealth. And so with that, I just accidentally like dropped into Penn State. And <laughs> I was very intrigued with all the differing engineering degrees they had. But I, I really had no clue if I wanted to follow mechanical side like my father or electrical or computer science. So I actually came into Penn State in a branch campus at Berks because it was close to family um, because family is so very dear to me growing up in uh, an Italian family. And and uh, that's uh, how I all started. And when I started going to Penn State Burke, someone approached me after I think during my second year and asked if I'd be interested in the Honors College. And I had no clue at all honesty about the Honors College back then. And so it was one of my professors who asked me and then I got a letter and I was like, well, there's no additional work here. <laughs> I'm already doing my math and science and engineering. Let's sure, let's try it. Um, it really was just how I fall into a lot of my roles and in, in saying yes to a new opportunity, a new growth. Um, and that's how it was all, uh, all by accident. And that's a common theme with a lot of guests on here is just saying yes to opportunities, knowing when to say no, if you take on too much, but saying yes to the opportunities that present themselves to you. Now, when you were at Berks, you came in, you, you know, you weren't sure exactly which type of engineering you wanted 
to do. So how did you go about for maybe for students who find themselves in a similar position right now, maybe they're a first year student and they're trying to determine what type of engineering is for them. How did you go about figuring that out? Oh, that was that was very interesting. So looking at the curriculum of engineering science and then the other engineering fields, what I was looking at was how I needed to be constantly challenged in differing fields of engineering. And so as I looked at the other fields, it was so very narrowly focused on one domain, whether it was electrical, getting very deep into the electrical world or mechanical with dynamics or in aerospace engineering uh, with its aerospace style dynamics classes and software. So what I started noticing is I didn't want to go deep into one. I wanted to see how they were interconnected and use principles from each engineering field. When I looked at engineering science as a degree, I loved it because it had depth of each field that I could bring together in a final project thesis. And that was a greater why for me. Plus another key reason was really about I didn't want to sit at a computer and do um, software coding all day or mechanical design or electrical wiring, or I thought I needed to see greater things and be greater than just one field, but be able to speak to them all and see where their value was. And engineering science was that. And that's really why I gravitated towards it. And plus it was an honors degree and I wanted to keep pushing myself for greater, greater excellence in academics. I thought, eh, might as well try this one and see how it goes. I mean, I don't know if I'll get a, you know, a, a job offer. And that was, that was interesting to sell myself, you know, after college or during college to get an internship or even a job. That's the thing about branding um, that I learned so much from engineering science. Well, we'll get into that job search in a minute because spoiler, you obviously did go on and are having a great career. But I do want to take a quick right turn here. You were involved in campus life, both at Berks and at University Park. And one of the things that jumped out to me on the list of things you were involved with was you were a cheerleader. And I think you might be the first cheerleader from any campus that I've had here on the podcast. So I wanted to ask, what were those experiences like? And how did you pull what you learned from those different clubs, be it the Berks Line Ambassadors or Women in Engineering and the cheerleading? How did you pull those into or how do you continue to pull those into your career leading the things that you do at Boeing? Oh, wonderful. Um, I've always loved sports, always played them growing up, cheerleading and lacrosse. I was very adaptable and moving around a lot as I grew up in rural PA, different high schools and middle schools uh, and just growing my network. I was very shy growing up, but I knew if I would connect with other people, I would just feel welcomed and really enrolled into just uh, some accomplishment that brought joy to others. And, and that joy was really about, you know, not only cheerleading at Burke's campus, but we were like really the first campus to start saying that we wanted to have like a cross Commonwealth campus kind of competition. And we would go up to main campus and start meeting every other cheerleading team and see how we could grow and, and together as a cheerleading community. That really helped with line ambassadors on the Berks campus for the tours and walking backwards and, and knowing the campus a lot more, but also just the camaraderie. And we brought uh, male cheerleaders in with us at Berks. And that was very interesting because coming from you know, high school, we did not have male cheerleaders. And they were so, so very helpful for us for our competitions up at main campus. So really just seeing the background of, you know, bringing what you love from your sport from your high school years or middle school years and being able to do that still at a branch campus, I wanted to, you know, reach out to them because I didn't stay on the campus, I actually commuted because I still had to work <laughs> on the weekends to help pay uh, for school. And um, that's what I was doing with tutoring, um, because tutoring actually helped in being a teaching assistant, uh, the financial support for me, but also seeing the joy when someone could actually learn something in a different way than how our teachers and professors provided it. So really to build a network, um, because I wasn't in a, you know, dorm there. Um, and just now today, I, I get back and I see my old Penn State notes and pictures and start connecting with them on LinkedIn. It's very interesting to see how long it's been, almost 20 years. <laughs> So one of those experiences, and you alluded to this earlier with kind of the capstone, if you will, in engineering science is obviously your honors thesis. So I read your your title 
um, in, in your questionnaire. And I'm going to be honest, I didn't understand a word of it. So maybe you, you can enlighten us on what you researched. You know, that was also fun. I, you know, I didn't know then, but I know now how important it is to do um, material science work on aluminum alloys for um, arresting gear for planes when they come onto carriers. Like as I, my career has been in defense, the majority of my career, I didn't know that I eventually fall into it. And I was doing my thesis on exactly that. If we cryogenically froze aluminum alloys that was on the resting gear of a carrier for the plane, would its strength profile be as great as if it wasn't? And so <clears throat> I was in the lab, <laughs> really just like taking these aluminum alloys and testing their their strength from a wear rate and seeing if that was comparable to the alloy that wasn't frozen. I had no idea all that data set had to be created like by hand. We had no automation in the tools. We didn't have a tool that could run the results for you overnight. You're sitting there in the lab and then you had to come up with your conclusion after your observation. So I learned so much from how much material science feeds into our application of design. Um, and that's why, you know, that degree brings theory with application in such a great way that you get to see a greater picture of a decision, a design decision you make could really impact uh, lives of your warfighter uh, for a lot of these systems. Um, so that was what my, if you boiled the thesis down, more or less in a lab, just really running wear tests on an aluminum alloy <laughs> to give you some observation on different, you know, material, uh, you know, properties of it. So something we sometimes hear from students is they're not going to grad school and, and so they're not excited about the thesis. But I know you we all talk about your graduate certificates in a little bit, but I have to imagine like your thesis was probably pretty helpful in your day job to start. Is that a is that a fair judgment? Oh, it was a fair judgment. Uh I I really love math and equations and physics. Writing is not, I would say, my strongest suit. So being able to bring an observation to realization with data made me really data focused in now my career in that anything I propose or the team proposes, it's data centric. And have we run a sampling of tests that have a distribution that can actually provide you a decision that you can make for the greater workforce? And that was what I took away from it. Not naturally, of course, going into material science for materials, for composites, for aircraft or uh, other types of, you know, application of it. It was more more or less the analytical thinking through it that thesis that helped uh, with uh, moving that forward, which was quite interesting that now you you bring those two together as you question that now. Uh, I didn't really tie them that closely, but thank you. Absolutely. Now, earlier you mentioned, you know, if you're in, say, mechanical engineering or computer science or in the other pure disciplines, if you will, in engineering, you know, employers are pretty clear, like this is what you're you're looking for. But in engineering science, you kind of have to take a little bit more of an active approach in how you're explaining that to employers for internships and jobs. So can you, can you talk about how you did that and how you got those first roles in your career? So I would say in my first roles in my early career, I was really assessing reliability, maintainability and system safety and human factors on the designs. And when I started looking at CAD drawings and unigraphics to electrical schematics and 2D drawings, I started really noticing that the depth of the school's degree in engineering science would provide me the depth to assess, you know, the electrical world or the mechanical world for dynamics and strength. And then that provided me some really insightful knowledge on I'm really more of analyzing the design for improving its performance for either the warfighter to maintain it or the reliability of it for its lifespan or the safety uh, aspect of it. So with that, you know, with my early career, it was really about analytical depth into each 
type of engineering design that I could bring, you know, to the forefront for these other engineers in the other fields. And that was very key in, in proving to me that I could bring all the differing disciplines together. And that I didn't know at the time was called systems engineering, uh, because I didn't know about that until four years into my engineering early career, that systems engineering was a discipline, um, because Penn State did not have that. And it and it wasn't, let's say, communicated that really those are the system thinkers of uh, that type of world. So it kind of opened up to me like, wow, you know, we could grow systems engineering in, you know, out of college uh, from their domain and, and get that systems thinking perspective. So for those of us who aren't engineers, can you define what you mean by systems engineering? Oh, I love systems engineering. I would say systems engineering is really the formalized techniques and methods to bring intra and interdisciplinary engineering together to assess the impacts of the whole and all of the elements that make up performance, functionality, interface and integration, whether it's a platform in the sky or in space or undersea, it is really assessing how it operates in its performance and why it operates by its functions. So systems engineers really do think greater than the parts. It's more of the whole. And and that really brings forward more of a data-centric view from each engineering field to see how it impacts for, let's say, the overall, what the warfighter or customer sees. And what they sometimes see is what they touch or with their eyes from a GUI. And that is very intriguing to me to see how systems engineering can be that, let's say, broker, liaison, collaborator, leader across engineering fields. Awesome. Well, I just learned something. And so if you <laughs> didn't know that either, listener, hopefully, you know, maybe you did if you clicked on this one because you were interested in what Tamara had to say. But if you didn't, hopefully you learned something too. You know, so you talked about your early career and I wanted to ask, so you began climbing the ladder. You were initially at Northrop Grumman, mm -hmm. uh, which is a major defense contractor. And we've had a past guest, uh, Tom Bon Saint, who w currently works there. If you want to go back and listen to that episode when you're done listening to this one. But I want to ask, so how did you, you know, shift from kind of the hands-on work that you were doing to more of the leadership roles that you started to take Talk to us through that, especially as a woman in en in an engineering setting. I think that would be really helpful for students to hear. Yeah, of course. When I was engineering the design for performance enhancements for many of the specialty areas, I started noticing that I had a keen for planning the effort, a keen for seeing where people had skills that could execute and build the products that I was I was building that I could lead and mentor them in how we can execute it and put together a cost and schedule for it. And I, I just saw that as a gap. And when I see gaps, I just want to step right into them and fill it up and learn myself from other leaders. And, and so with that, in my early career, five years in, I was noticing that I could actually lead a team and fill that gap and put together a vision and strategy on how we could execute execute, let's say, human systems integration for a program. That was just eye-opening to me that one of the key disciplines, or let's say areas that I didn't learn in college, was all of that. How to actually plan a project, do cost and schedule, um, lead a team, mentor our team. And that is where I just was so very excited to grow in that area. And that's how I then transitioned from engineering the design to being the lead and collaborator with all other engineers to build an integrated product team and then move forward. Now, I was still an engineer, individual contributor, and then I would transition over into, you know, leadership in that way as a technical lead engineer. So you talked about, you know, there's skills that you come out of Penn State with, but then you obviously need to continue enhancing your skills well past being a student. And, you know, some of those may be formal, some of those may be informal. So can you talk about how you continued to learn whether it was new engineering technologies or I hate this phrase, but the soft skills, the leadership and the, the managing people that you need for these types of leadership roles? Oh, yes, of course. Especially, you know, as I transitioned from my early career into my mid-career as a leader, there were new techniques and modeling languages that were coming into the forefront. And as I was rolling into becoming a system architect on a platform, I wanted to 
hear about how I could take what I did in the analysis world into architecture. And that was a modeling language called systems modeling language uh, that drove up uh, into compliance into a Department of Defense architecture framework, which is DOTA. And I was not familiar with that language and that framework. So I wanted to bring together people and vendors to teach us on that framework and bring individuals to say, how, what are our best practices and lessons learned? So even in my early career, when I didn't know about a technique, I would bring individuals from the outside that had the experience so I could learn and apply it with the team. And then, you know, later in my career, I started learning about other, you know, like degrees that were coming out because there wasn't a certificate for systems engineering. And so Johns Hopkins had a wonderful systems engineering certificate and master's program. And that's when I started realizing that systems engineering is a real thing. And I was that thinker, but I didn't know how to apply the principles of systems engineering from industry. And that's where it brought me into how do I become more of a technical manager, an architect, someone who can assess performance perform validation and verification and certification. All the other areas I didn't get to touch as an early engineer and assess and, and do. So I was like, well, I'm, I'm pretty young out of college. I didn't go get my graduate degree right away. And it's okay. You don't need to get it right away. You can learn as you go because your career will change and you'll be interested in different things. So as they come up, you just be uncomfortable, be comfortable with being uncomfortable and trying new things. I mean, it's so very fun. Engineering can be fun again if you just go out there and, and talk to others that have that experience and let them know you want to learn from them. I think that's great advice and probably true for any industry too. Uh, mm -hmm. Go out there and learn from others who are just as excited as you are, who can share knowledge. Now, I, I do want to, this is not one of the questions I had in my, in <laughs> my sheet here, but just out of curiosity for maybe those who may also not know. So you keep talking about architecture and being an architect, and obviously that has a different meaning in an engineering setting and the systems engineering and the kind of things that you're doing with aircraft or submarines or, or space craft or, or anything. So can you define what you mean by that in this context? Yes, of course. So systems architecture um, is really bringing parts, functional performance interface parts together into, let's say, logical groupings to see how they interact and affect each other. And so in that sense, systems architecting is modularizing functionality and then, and then going into how do I allocate that to an electrical piece, like either a circuit card or an FPGA, and then does that really need a mechanical structural piece with a backplane to execute it. So systems engineering thinks all above the engineering fields before applying it to say, if I want to functionally like communicate air to ground, what functions do I need within the air segment or the ground segment? And what kind of human interface and interplay do I need? So really systems architecting, if you think about it, is not really the physical things that you touch, like an aircraft or a GUI, right? Or something at the keyboard, you think abstractly up as like some amorphic, like, like conceptual thing of, oh, well, that functionality could live anywhere. We don't know yet. All I know is that I need a mission processor. I need a receiving, you know, signal or exciting the signals, or I need some communications engine or payload processor. So you just need certain functionality to execute your mission, whatever mission that may be. And systems architecting is bringing all of those functionality parts and performance of those parts together to realize what is the main sets of use cases and goals and capabilities that my warfighter and customer need. So it's really that type of thinker that isn't saying, well, I need a box here. I need a comms device here. I need, you know, this other, you know, payload a radar, EOIR here, like we all come from touching what we see every day. And we want to say those are the parts that need to go into the house or into the aircraft, but maybe it doesn't need to go that way anymore, be built that way. So it really grounds us into more innovation as a systems engineer. It doesn't always have to be the way it's been for three decades or four decades. You don't have to create the same type of, you know, cell phone like we did back in the day, right? That's where I think systems engineering with the system architecture helps. So to use your analogy of a house, it's more of how do you make the house a home? No, yeah. Is that, a, is that fair? 
to that is the, dumb the, it down for us, <laughs> us non-engineers. Yeah, it's kind of like caring about like the workflow of the home kind of like, you know, you're not going to like all of a sudden be like, oh, well, I'm going to, you know, put the piping and electrical here. But what's the use of it? Why? Why do you need it? Like, what is your your conditions for having it there? Will it operate in the workflow of your home, it, you know, for you as a person? Right now, you're bringing the human element into it, into the discussion more about what they need and why they need it versus saying, well, I could just put it here and there and like, right, I could just plop it right there. So it's quite a different way of thinking. And speaking of different ways of thinking, you shared what you're currently doing in your role at the time of recording at Boeing and tying back to you said you really like data more than writing. And so this kind of seems to fit right up your interest alley. So no surprises what you're doing. Can you talk about and again, you know, you're you're speaking as yourself, but and you're not going to give away trade secrets or anything. But can you talk about what kind of uh, general efforts you are leading right now? Yes, of course. So my current role is the deputy functional chief engineer for digital and systems engineering for Boeing. And what I'm doing and what we are doing right now is connecting various different digital models. Um, So like I said before, now it's all in the data, right? And the data of any digital model that you create um, and how do we connect them and where is the the data then transitions into information, right? You add some information to it about who the user is, what attributes you need, and then you add some knowledge. Is knowledge is more of the user experience with it and how I've used it on this application or that application. So it's really bringing digital models together in not a sense of totally integrating them into a monolithic thing. It's really federated in the sense now they're each unique and in their uniqueness, they have such key data elements that trace to each other and that can help with creating a product. So an aircraft product, it can do it for you know, even a navigation system on the aircraft. And how can you digitally represent that data for your product and also the services, right? Sustainment out in the field, there's data with all of our products, commercial or even defense products that we have around the world. So how do we bring that and digital data and then help inform a digital twin, right? That digital twin, right, is bringing together real, real hardware and software and informing what your virtual prototype is. And so you can help improve the structural design, the thermal design, the mesh design, the functional performance. Uh, And so with that, you know, we are really creating a digital thread framework here at Boeing, and we're leading the way in innovation of how to use knowledge and visualize that for the user or an engineer can ask a question, you know, where does this data reside and how can I see it and expose it and access it and interrogate it? How can I use it? Because we have these search engines, but how do we search, right? We always ask a question of our best friend (laughs) or someone that's in the next cube or the next office. So it'd be great for us to move that forward with you know, transforming how we do the business. And and when we transform the business of how we do it, then we transform what comes to the forefront of the data and what questions we ask and can it intelligently put it together for us. That is what is so very intriguing now that bringing data from my my early career into like at the such the forefront. And I am just really focused on bringing that to just every engineer. Well, I'm sure that's very exciting for all of the engineers and you can't see uh, Tamara's face right now, but she's been glowing talking about this, just like <laughs> the biggest smile. So you can tell she was geeking out a bit and I didn't understand all of it, but it sounds incredible. Uh, and I can get the helping people do their job better part. I think that translates across industry. And for scholars who you know, are excited by this kind of thing, what can they be doing now as students or early in their career, if they say they're a young alum, to set themselves up for this kind of career work? Mm, That's great. You know, in the COSI 2035 vision, which is a wonderful booklet about engineering solutions for the better world that is out there for all engineers that could really search for it, any Schreier scholar or someone just intrigued about systems engineering, there are some key new, let's say, skills in systems engineering that is coming to the forefront. And those skills are really centered around data science, data science for really looking at, you know, what is the representation, digital representation of data? 
How can we bring algorithms and analytics to the forefront and the mathematics that we've all learned near and dear that have governing principles in our designs? How do we do that for data, right? So data science would be the first foremost if there are some programs or some courses to take to be a part of that world. That is the demand in this new world is being able to assess, analyze, extract visualize data from differing fields of engineering or manufacturing supply chain and showing that knowledge to others that is where i would say where we need to move forward with you know adding to our current curriculums in each of our engineering fields because before we were relying on the tools but not every tool has widgets to help us visualize the data or the back end schema of a tool and why we did what we did right we're just assuming it knows best for it to, it to run an analysis we want it to do, but you'll see engineers always create their own little tool to bring the data out and visualize it in a way that's meaningful, meaningful for them. So that is what I would recommend to get into this world. There's much in user experience, virtualization that brings that to the forefront as well. And maybe there's some courses, some robotics do that, some computing, um, computer science might be some of those skills and courses could be brought into other engineering fields, but those are just some key areas is that I, I do sense as where it's going to really be a dynamic change for the, the future of engineering. Well, you heard it here first. So if you're listening, take advantage of that really stellar advice right there. And one thing that probably will transcend any kind of you know, digital transformation and, and all these things is being part of a larger community in your industry. So how do you stay engaged with the engineering community, both at Boeing and also outside of Boeing with other engineers? Oh, wonderful question. So it was about like a decade ago when I started engaging with the object management group, OMG, oh, through standards. They release standards uh, specifically on different areas, but what I was focused on was systems modeling language and unified architecture framework. And then from that experience, talking to industry about not just applying it to defense systems, but transportation and healthcare, I started getting exposed to other industries that were using those standards and how they were using it and being involved in a standards body to help increase its validity and its rigorous execution was just eye-opening because you're so focused in your own world with your own industry, your own job. And when you come out and you breathe and you realize there's more to what you're working on and you can give back, it's so much more fulfilling. So really standards bodies is one area. Another area that I'm actively involved in is in COSI, International Council of Systems Engineering. We have a formalized working group there. And with that, it's called the Digital Engineering Information Exchange Working Group. And so with that is directly on the statement of how do we create digital views and viewpoints for the users. And that could be someone who's requested the view or someone who's building the view. And that working group brings a plethora of industries together to really move forward with what would be a new guidebook for digital engineering. And also what other standard definitions and taxonomies do we need in this world? Um, because we all have our different definition of what a part means. Um, and so why don't we come together and, and as an industry move that forward. So in my current role, that is, I am still the deputy chair there. I'm also Boeing's and Coast company uh, leader. So what is our strategy for getting more systems engineers certified in systems engineering? But not only that, but learning that there's a community that is building out technical publications. And so those best practices and lessons learned are being documented out there. Maybe not so digitally, they're still paper, so they're digitized. But that's where I'm thinking, you know, engagement as we all grow in our career, like reach out and, you know, just be in there and listen. And you could grab a nugget and use it on your program, your project, your company. But constantly being engaged to learn more is just uh, really fulfilling. I had to chuckle a little bit when you said that you're, some of these things are ending up on paper. Like I'm picturing like holograms and you know, <laughs> like Tony Stark doing stuff. And, and then you're 
some of these things end up just getting printed on paper. Love it. They, they still do. They still do. So kind of pivoting a little bit again, kind of outside, you know, how have you found balance between your personal and professional lives as, you know, you're a senior leader at this major company that is a global presence. And then you're also a leader in your family and you've had to move around the country for your career. So how do you balance those things? What advice do you have for students as they maybe think ahead or for young alumni who are starting to experience this? Yes. One one area that I would always state is have a partner in life that supports your career ambitions like my husband, Charles, does. Someone who can see that the fulfillment you drive into really needs a support entity at home with the family uh, and really pushes for you to experience going to conferences, traveling the world, and really speaking to what your truth is for learning and bringing others together for engineering. I mean, that is one of my first and foremost, whether it is, you know, a family member that helps you or best friend or a spouse or a partner or someone that's there for you, because that is what you'll need is that foundation to always fall back on when it doesn't always go right. Or maybe you're traveling every week and you're not there for tucking the children in or, you know, going to your friend's birthday party or your family is like retirement just an under someone who can truly understand that's the first and foremost I think second is with that support entity being so like open-minded and not scared like uh moving you know from myself I was in Maryland for 13 years then moved to California for a year then Utah for two years now in Pennsylvania I mean not being afraid that a new area could provide so much more for you in the sense of food, people, community, um, just exploration, right? It's very hard to move to a new place and not know anyone. Trust, you know, it's hard even when you have a family, like who's your neighbor's going to be? Like, who are you going to hang out with on the weekends? But just do you, do what you enjoy and other people will be around that enjoy the same things. So be be okay with being scared. It's actually great exhilarating to be afraid um, because you never know what will happen for you, not to you, right? I think that's a very insightful way to, to phrase that there. I really like that. <laughs> Welcome. Now we're kind of pivoting to the back part of our conversation. And I think it's been well established at this point that I'm not an engineer. And some of the things <laughs> you've said have definitely gone over my head. But I'm here to, you know, be the voice of our students and alumni asking you these questions. So I did my best. But are there any questions about engineering work or leadership that I should have asked but didn't know to? Um, or maybe phrased a different way. What's a question that you often get from maybe your entry level employees or students that I didn't think to ask that would be helpful to answer here. I do get asked, how do you, how do you get, how do you feel heard at work, right? As a woman in engineering, right? And I go through many stories and, you know, one story, you know, at, at a previous company, you know, I was presenting in front of, uh, it was a critical design review. I was a IPT integrated product team leader. You know, I was only five years in, I was scared. I was rehearsing, you know, what I was going to say to the T <laughs> and, and, you know, I said this statement about how the warfighter, you know, is included into the designing of the system, right? They are a a part of the system. They are an external entity and someone raised their hand in this 400 person auditorium and they said, you know, do engineers listen to you? And I was taken back, right? At first, like, oh, what kind of question was that, right? But I came back with like, I'm just a smaller master guns. Of course, they're going to listen to me. I, you know, I was informing them that the master gunnery sergeant I was working with on that program, right? He had this confidence in a room. And so I had all, all the auditorium laugh. And, and I knew at that moment, if you can build a sense of confidence in yourself in any meeting, in any call, and know in your feelings of your, your inner self that you are stating what is true, then no one else could quiet that voice of confidence or that voice of reason and go forward with trying to make them laugh because what they were asking, maybe they didn't know they had biases in, in what their question was. And now you're trying to teach them in a more uh, different type of way. And so in that sense, when, when I get asked as a leader, like, how do you come to a, a meeting with the voice of confidence that you have? Well, I had to go through 
and, and learn through wick, working with other engineers in, in different genders that, that spoke to me differently. And so I just I guess I just grew up in this field over 20 years, you know, in 18 years, yeah, 18 years now, that just stating your confident, you know, position and always staying true to that. I think that was, would be a question that women in engineering uh, have asked me before. And I've always said, you know, I can be your ally and support you and give me a call. I can come to the meeting, you know, and I will you know, talk about the position that you hold in the sense of your position of words, right? And kind of bolster that and and start speaking for you and advocating. So I think that's one of the key things. We don't know that we have allies in the back that, that can help advocate and be there next to you. That is very good and important thing that you talked about there. And obviously... I'm a man. I wouldn't have even thought to ask that. So thank you for, for answering that question that way. You're welcome. Now we're going to go to the last third. The, these are the questions I asked everybody if you're a regular listener. So thank you if you are. What would you say is your biggest success to date? This is your chance to brag a little bit. I would say professional success would definitely be when I positioned to create an organization in my previous company to be called Model Based Systems Engineering. Because in systems engineering, we all want all systems engineers to perform Model Based Systems Engineering, which is a method to systems engineering, more of a formalized technique uh, using modeling languages. And so it's kind of very intriguing that, you know, the mindset is... Well, we all should be, but we all aren't doing that. And we need to build the skill. So how can we marry a new skill of model-based with systems engineering that has been executing in the technical domain for decades and bring those two together to say that is systems engineering of the future. So the success there was really about creating a functional organization to grow leaders in model-based systems engineering. And some of those leaders I've known have grown into great leaders at other companies at SAIC. I know many any of those team members now that we were all learning together and leading together, they now are leading on their own. I just see so much of them as like we were at the forefront of starting something when we were at Northrop Grumman together and seeing them prosper. It's just like a, it's just such, so fulfilling, like a mother head in, in the sense of, wow, look at them spread their wings and go and lead others and mentor others and make new innovations. And so professionally, like I still reach out to them to this day and just, I'm just so proud of their accomplishments wherever they may land and just makes me very proud. So that that's definitely one key success, I would say. And professionally, of course, personally, it's it's really about just, I can't believe I have children in this career. And so my success is able now to see the, the joy that I can bring at home for them, not just for me, for my job, but for them and, and be the mom for them by crafting and having fun and dance parties. I mean, I... I mean, I just seen my little mini me's run around. It's wonderful. <laughs> That's hilarious. And I keep seeing this. There's like a Minecraft toy in the background. Oh, behind yeah. you. <laughs> I love Minecraft so much. I do. Uh, Tamara, I want to give you a chance. Oh, my gosh. <laughs> She's holding up a Minecraft, some kind of stuffed toy, something. <laughs> I'm not. I'm just a hair too old to know Minecraft, but uh, you so. Do. Um, I do want to give you a chance. There was a, a little anecdote you had left in the questionnaire. So a bonus success here related to Penn State homecoming. That... Oh, yeah. Thanks for reminding me. I was like wondering, like you saw me thinking, I'm like, what was I? Yes. So Penn State homecoming. And I still have the sweatshirt. Like I made all my Penn State stuff into a quilt. So all my old like homecoming t-shirts, sweatshirts, bar tours <laughs> into this quilt. And so I had to remind myself, what year was that? And it was 2003. I'm like, wow, 20 years, 20 years ago, homecoming, 20 years ago. I was part of Society of Women Engineers up at main campus and Tau Epsilon Phi. We, we come together, right, with a uh, fraternity to work on a float. And the float idea was the Jetsons. So I've never done this before, right? That's my first year up at Penn State, Maine. I came from a Burks campus. I'm like, what is this stuff? What is, what is homecoming? And it was what like- What is this chicken wire stuff? <laughs> chicken wire and this paper mache thingy that hurts your hands because you keep poking it in the holes constantly and 
it was just, I had no idea. I was like, nah, like we're not going to win. Like it's Jetsons. Like, so we were all the characters of the Jetsons and roaming around the float, you know, going down. I don't even know what street it was. <laughs> I don't What street were they? I don't know where they go now, but that was a, that was a great like feeling of like, wow, even the smallest things with all of these individuals could build this beautiful float. And we won homecoming. I was like, no, look at all these beautiful, like I had, I was just always like, t- like not a good self-talk back then. And then I realized, you know, as I grew up, I was like, you need to bring better self-talk and like, hey, you could win. You could actually win this whole thing. So it was a wonderful experience of a Penn State to, to be a part of homecoming and, and winning that for the float. All these different pieces and people coming together to build something. It's not like that didn't foreshadow your career at all. I think that was a very positive omen for you, for you there. So on the flip side, though, I would do want to ask, because I ask everybody, can you tell us about a transformational learning moment or a mistake that you made throughout your career? And what, more importantly, like what you took from that that could be beneficial for scholars to also learn from? Yeah, definitely. I mean, <clears throat> when when I was at my previous company, I was I was so... I was so adamant about how to do systems engineering, especially model-based systems engineering, because of the experience I had for, you know, 15 years or so on and so forth before that. And I got so stuck with knowing the how that I forgot to allow others to lead and others to think through what their new how was. And there's like no course to help you with transitioning from an engineering doing and how mindset to a relaxed, like, well, here is the what and the why and when go and fly and do the how, right? And so that was a learning moment for me to really step back now, you know, within Boeing to really be like, here's the vision, here is there is our strategy. This is when we need to get this accomplished. This is why. And these are what our customers and warfighters need. Go forward and figure the how. I'll be here to help remove roadblocks and help support and advocate. You know, I can provide some how from my experience if you ask. If you want that advice. So it's been such a learning moment for me. Even at home, I'm trying to be more like, oh, that's how you do the dishes or that's how you fold the laundry. Okay, that's what you do, right? So I'm trying to transition into not being so, I guess, micromanagement in that way of like, it has to be in this order, like to bake a pie or you know, things of that nature. Or this is how you have to do a digital model, right? No, really, you don't have to do it that way. You can At least you can all come together and eventually have a pie, okay? <laughs> Yeah, maybe with the actual pie crust, there might be a set way, but a lot of things like it's more important that the laundry is getting done than how it's getting done. That's I think that's great. You know, you already gave a shout out to your husband, but are there any other professors or friends from your days on campus, either at Berks or at University Park that you want to give a shout out to? Oh, uh, Dr. Judith Todd. She was our dean for engineering science. Uh, I'm not sure if she's still there. Um, there was a women in engineering program leader, Barbara. I was able to get my internship with Northrop Grumman through there. Dr. Drew's Todd was great with engineering science. They supported, you know, me because, uh, through many scholarships, right. For pay- myself paying through college. And they were just, so just, just there all the time. Whenever I had a question, not even financial, just, it was really technical questions. And so though, that was definitely very key for me. I think there are others from Penn State Berks that I, you know, I haven't looked back and see, I still have all my notes, so I should probably go look and see, but those were the two that come to my mind. Awesome. And I'm sure there's many others and, you know, build up that network, go to your professor's office hours, get to know your club advisors. These are the folks that you'll be, you'll be hopefully remembering their names down the road, um, but get to know them. Is there any last piece of advice that you would leave students with that hasn't come up already? I would say get advice from many, but advice is just advice. It doesn't dictate your career path. It just provides you nuggets to build your own pathway to what you believe is already innate in yourself and gravitate towards listening and being your authentic self when you hear those words. And then you build your own mountain of career, whatever that may be, because someone else's career path was what they had to go through. It doesn't mean it's yours. And if someone, you know, is recommending to take this new opportunity, right? And in your gut, you know it, you need to take it. That's my perspective because I don't question my gut anymore. I just go with it. Uh, so those are the two, right? Take nuggets from all advice. Not every career path is is equal in the sense, 
but each nugget that they took and they learned is something you can bring together and create your own mountain of nuggets for your own self. And then, you know, yeah, just really believe in yourself, be authentic to yourself and listen to your gut. It will prove to you that it knows, it knows where you should gravitate towards. Excellent. Or to re- kind of reflect on our conversation, you could pull in some data points and help build your own architecture. I learned something today and I hope you did too. <laughs> If a scholar wanted to get some additional data points from you to keep this running, what's the best way that they could reach out to connect with you? Definitely through LinkedIn uh, would be great. I am a mentor in line link as well. Um, so you can reach out there. So I do that uh, throughout you know, my, the past few years, I love that. So either of those two venues and I always respond uh, and then we can continue from there. Awesome. Thank you for that. I appreciate you being a mentor, being on here today. And also you talked about, you know, the financial support you received as a student. We didn't even talk about you're a donor to the college, which we appreciate helping pay it forward to current scholars. So thank you for that. And we're going to wrap up here with our final question that I ask everybody. So hopefully you got a chance to look at the menu. If you were a flavor of Berkey Creamery ice cream, Tamara, which would you be? And most importantly, as a scholar alumna, why would you be that flavor? Chocolate marshmallow is what I would choose. Why I would choose it. Chocolate, because it's very decadent. So at times I can be very much decadent in, in all of the work I do and the data I have to analyze, right? Marshmallow, because sometimes I can be fun and fluffy and have, have fun in engineering or have fun at home and do dance parties at the same time, be structured like chocolate and, and get us, you know, formulated in, you know, what are the logistics of the day or in trips? And so, you know, I really feel like those two coming together is just is synergistic of my life and career and personally. And that's and that's why. That is a great way to sum up your experience <laughs> with the nice cream flavor there. Tamara Hambrick from Boeing, Scholar Alumna and Engineering Executive and Leader. Thank you so much for joining us and sharing all of your great nuggets of advice here on Following the Gong. Well, thank you, Sean, for having me. Thank you, scholars, for listening and learning with us today. We hope you will take something with you that will contribute to how you shape the world. This show proudly supports the Schreier Honors College Emergency Fund, benefiting scholars experiencing unexpected financial hardship. You can make a difference at raise.psu.edu forward slash Schreier. Please be sure to hit the relevant subscribe, like, or follow button on whichever platform you are engaging with us on today. You can follow the college on Instagram and LinkedIn to stay up to date on news, events, and deadlines. If you have questions about the show or are a Scholar alum who'd like to join us as a guest here on Following the Gone, please connect with me at scholaralumni at psu.edu. Until next time, please stay well, and we are 